Welcome to today's webinar, GMP Clean Room Routine Environmental Monitoring and 21 CFR Part 11 Data Integrity. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Beckman Culture Life Sciences. To learn more, visit Beckman.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I would like to now present today's speaker, Tony Harrison, Senior Marketing Manager, Beckman Culture Life Sciences. Tony, you may now begin your presentation. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that introduction. So, hello and welcome everyone to this short webinar today on Clean Room Environmental Monitoring and 21 CFR Part 11 Data Integrity. Uh, as per the introduction, my name is Tony Harrison and I am a Senior Manager for Beckman Coulter. I was also the uh, UK expert to the ISO Working Group responsible for writing the 2015 edition of the ISO standard for clean rooms, ISO 14644-1. Before we begin, I wanted to share this quote with you because I thought it was very uh, on point. Sometimes clean room routine environmental monitoring programs can seem very burdensome and with the sheer volume of manual sampling leading to a high volume of data to be managed. And this sheer volume of data can be confusing and lead to lack of clarity and data integrity errors. So in today's short webinar, I will cover the GMP requirements for clean room monitoring and for classification and explain the difference between the two. I will also outline why routine monitoring presents such a challenge to data integrity and finally, I'll give some brief highlights onto the new Clarity software for routine monitoring and how it can automate these programs and help reduce data errors. So first of all, let's take a look at the GMPs and the World Health Organization uh, uh, guidance for clean rooms and also take a look at the ISO standard for clean rooms, ISO 14644-1-2015. Now, of course, we're all very painfully aware of the current global COVID pandemic and its injectable drugs like the vaccines that we're all receiving now that are, in fact, the biggest risk for contamination for humans. And this is because, of course, as we've probably seen over the last few weeks and months, they are injected directly into the human body. And by doing so, they bypass our defenses and any microbial contamination they may contain would cause an infection possibly blood poisoning and, and possibly death. Our most vulnerable are the weak and immunocompromised. And again, we've heard about that with the COVID pandemic. And this includes such uh, patients as premature birth babies. Um, if they're born too early, they have a very weak immune system and they can't feed from the mother. Uh, so we have to feed them, of course, using intravenous drip bags. Which, they, which contain all the food that they need in the form of total parental nutrition. Now, the issue is, if any contamination gets into those uh, uh, parental nutrition bags, then it will cause almost certain death to these very, very weak and immunocompromised uh, patients. So here's a not, not too uh, old example of what happens when clean room contamination control goes wrong. Um, in 2012, in North America, a manufacturing clean room of a small compounding company became contaminated with a spore-forming fungus, and this found its way into the drug product. Now, this particular drug product they were making was a very strong painkiller killer, delivered to patients via direct injection into their spinal cord. 17,000 vials were contaminated. Sadly, 64 people died when they were injected, 
Uh, and they died from meningitis, which is a swelling of the membranes of the brain, as the fungus, in, fungus invaded their nervous system. And again, sadly, 750 more people were infected before they, they did the drug recall, and there is no cure. Now, the biggest challenge in clean rooms is the contamination risk that the people working in the clean rooms present to the product. The average human being has around 100,000 billion bacteria on and inside their body. Now, we shed over 30,000 skin cells per hour. In fact, we shed and replace our entire skin every month. And each of these skin cells is smaller than the human eye can see and carries many microbes which could contaminate the pharmaceutical product. In fact, during the course of a year, we shed 3.6 kilos of skin cells. So now let's take a look at the, um, the USA GMP document, the CGMP document, and compare it to the European and the World Health Organization GMP documents. Now they define the acceptable levels of, of airborne particles in clean rooms for sterile drug manufacturing. And both the GMP and the CGMP document call up the ISO standard 14644-1 for the methodology for clean room classification. So just for classification. So let's take a look at the GMP uh, regulations. This is the current table for air particle contamination levels in the European GMP Annex 1, and also the guide for sterile manufacturing from the World Health Organization. Now you can see there are four grades of clean room defined from the very cleanest, which is the grade A, through to the dirtiest grade D. You can see that the European GMP calls for two particle sizes to be measured, uh, 0.5 microns and 5 microns. And this is the same the world over. It's the same in the World Health Organization documents. And the only difference is in the North American CGMP document, which only calls for 0.5 micron particles to be measured and reported. reported. Now, all particle counts are reported in particle counts per cubic meter. And this itself can present a potential area of error for our customer, uh, for our users because in order to reduce the amount of time taken in environmental prog programs each day, the sample taken at each location by the air particle counter is typically just one minute sample. Now with a particle counter that samples at a flow rate of one cubic foot per minute, it means that the sample taken during that minute is just one cubic foot of air. Now there are approximately 35.2 cubic feet in one cubic meter of air. So the user must multiply that one minute sample by 35.2 to get the count per meter. Now, it's true to say that most particle counters can be programmed to automatically make this calculation for the user, but it is another configuration step that the user has to remember to do to ensure results are reported correctly. Now, as I mentioned, people are the biggest source of contamination in the clean room environment. So workers in clean rooms have to pass through several different clean rooms to enter the production site, suite. Sorry. Each area is separated by an airlock to minimize the flow of air from the dirty outer rooms into the clean production area. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Particle counters have to be sanitized as they pass from one grade of clean room to another to avoid contamination being carried through. And this is typically done by spraying them with an industry alcohol spray called IPA. The dirtiest room is the grade D, and staff are required to change in this room out of their outdoor clothes and into clean room clothes. They then pass through into the grade C preparation area, where equipment to be used in production is prepared and assembled. And finally, they're quite often required again to change as they pass through into the grade C preparation, uh, sorry, into the grade B production area. Generally, the grade A production filling area is protected by a barrier system, either an isolator or a restricted access barrier or RABS, and that prevents the workers from entering 
And if this is the case, then the environment around that grade A area can be grade C. But if there's no physical barrier for the filling zone, then the background to that grade A must be grade A. Now, I mentioned that the North American CGMP document differs to the European and the World Health Organization guidance in that it only mentions one particle size, the 0.5 micron particle. However, drug manufacturers based in North America wanting to sell their products outside of North America and into the rest of the world, they'll have to count particles at both 0.5 and 5 microns, as they must be in compliance with the standards used in the country to which they want to export. Now, vaccine manufacturing plants are a rather unique subset of biopharma production in that the production of a vaccine is quite often done by cultivating high concentrations of disease-causing pathogen. And this is done in bioreactors that are optimized to support cell growth. Unfortunately, these bioreactors are also optimal to support microbial growth. So this gives the manufacturer additional challenges over and above a manufacturer of, of other injectable drug products. Extra care must be taken to avoid bacteria from the production staff from getting into the bioreactors. And at the same time, great care must be taken to prevent cross-contamination uh, between the production lines. Hence, vaccine production lines and the staff and equipment working on them are usually kept separated from each production line to prevent this cross-contamination. Now, these challenges are so well known that the World Health Organization have these dedicated guidance specifically for environmental monitoring of clean rooms in vaccine manufacturing facilities. Now, as I mentioned earlier, both the European GMP and the North American CGMP documents tell the reader to refer to the class classification procedures laid down in the ISO standard 14644-1. Now, the ISO standard is not a GMP document, and it's designed to give guidance rather than mandate, but the fact that it's referenced by the GMPs effectively gives it the same status as a GMP document for those manufacturers regulated by GMP. The ISO has a wide range of clean room classes from one to nine, and it covers particle sizes from 0.1 micron up to five microns in size, and then, of course, the number of particles per cubic meter for each class is defined in the table. Now, the idea is that the user must decide what particle sizes they are interested in and how clean the clean room must be uh, to carry out their process. And then they choose a subset of the clean room class and particle size from the ISO table. GMP has decided uh, that the particle size of interest are 0.5 and five microns. And you can see from the grade B at rest from the European GMP that the number of particles matching match ISO class five. So those numbers are directly lifted from the ISO. But an important thing to note here is that the 2015 version of the ISO standard no longer specifies <clears throat> the number of particles at five microns for ISO class five. However, users who are regulated and complying with the GMP rules, they have to measure the five microns too. So the fact it's not mentioned in the ISO standard does not mean that GMP clean room users no longer have to measure the five micron particle. They do because it's mentioned in GMP. So let's take a look now at the difference between clean room classification and routine monitoring. Of course, portable air particle counters are used for both applications in the GMP clean room, classification and, of course, routine environmental monitoring, but they are very different things. The clean room classification process is very well defined in the ISO standard 14644, whereas it is the responsibility of the clean room user to define the routine environmental monitoring program specific to their own pro production process the product they're manufacturing and their clean room design. The user has to take ownership of their environmental monitoring program and must design the program based on a risk assessment of the specific pro process pro products they're making and the clean room. 
Now, this, as I mentioned, classification is very well defined in the ISO standard, and it focuses actually on the clean room rather than the product safety. So it makes sure that the clean room itself is performing to the target cleanliness class. It's very well defined, as I say, and it's usually carried out every six or 12 months. Now, ISO standard 14644 tells the user how to calculate the number of sample locations required for the clean room. It depends on the size of the clean room, basically. And then it tells the user to lay these sampling locations out on an evenly distributed grid pattern across the room. There's no requirement in the ISO standard to take samples where the product may be at risk of airborne contamination. So in the example on the screen here, and this is just an example just to, to explain, uh, following the ISO standard means that there are no samples taken in areas where potentially the product may be at risk. For example, the descrambler table, the filling zone itself, and the stoppering zone, or indeed the capping station. Now, for clean room environmental monitoring, there are actually no hard and fast rules here. There's no document defining exactly how many sample locations and where you should sample. The user must make a risk assessment of where the product may be exposed in their process to airborne contamination and set sampling locations at these points for their routine environmental monitoring programs. So if we go back to the example I was showing a moment ago uh, for the clean room, which is being classified, you can see that the, the classification asks for them to be laid out in a, in a grid pattern, but um, the theoretical uh, example we're using here, they've taken a look at their manufacturing process and they've decided on those locations where the products may be at risk from airborne contamination and they've laid out their sampling program appropriately for routine monitoring. And you'll notice these sample locations highlighted by the yellow numbers there, are they're very different locations to those used for classification. So they're very different. Classification looks at the room, monitoring looks at hazard to your process, very different things. So you need to be aware of that. So let's take a look at the root cause as to why routine environmental monitoring can provide challenge in regards to maintaining data integrity. Now, routine environmental monitoring can be a, typically a very manual process involving the collection of thousands of samples each month using portable particle counters. Typically, there are manual SOP steps which must be followed uh, in, a, in a routine environmental monitoring program. First, of course, the technician has to make sure that they're using the correct version of the environmental monitoring SOP, which is typically a paper-based document. And then they have to follow the sampling map in the SOP and go to each sample location defined. They then have to manually type the location name into the air particle counter via the on-screen keyboard. And next, they have to configure the counter to sample for the correct amount of time and for the correct number of samples according to the SOP for each location. Next, they print the sample results out from the counter and handwrite comments onto the printout and sign it with their name. And at the end of each day, they photocopy all the paper printouts and then they manually type the results uh, into, uh, from every piece of paper into an electronic record. And finally, the electronic record itself is reviewed by the supervisor to ensure that all the samples have been taken and the data in the electronic record actually matches the paper printouts. So as you can see, this is a very manual process. And with thousands of samples per month, thousands of pieces of paper, and manual data transcriptions, the opportunity for human error to creep in and impact the integrity of that data is very high. Now, in their 2018 guidance, the FDA introduced the acronym ALCOA, saying that a good electronic record should be attributable to the person who's taking the sample, they're suggesting it shouldn't be handwritten because sometimes handwriting can be misinterpreted or, or illegible, in fact. 
They're suggesting these records should be made contemporaneously, which means at the same time the measurement is made, rather than created at a later time. And pay for printouts. And it should be the original record and the data it contains should be, of course, accurate, which is where human error can come in. Oops, sorry. So let's take a look now at the uh, Clarity software and how it can help uh, uh, make routine environment, environmental monitoring less error prone. Clarity software actually runs inside the particle counter itself, allowing you to improve the accuracy because your own SOP sampling map can be uploaded onto the counter screen. So this creates an interactive version on screen. And Clarity software includes um, electronic records straight from the counter itself, and they can be exported via Wi-Fi or wired Ethernet as standard um, automatically. And the data is exported in a PDF, a secure PDF file, and Excel, um, which is exactly what the FDA recommends. They suggest PDF in their 21 CFR Part 11 guidance. It uses um, Microsoft Active Directory for credentials for username and password. So you use the same credentials for the particle counter as you would use for your company computer when you log on in the morning. And it also uses a secure file transfer uh, using something called LDAP. So on the left hand side here, you can see a typical electronic record created by the particle counter. Now you'll notice it says the SOP version on, on the screen here. That's because the SOPs are controlled in the counter itself. I'll go into that in a minute, but it, uh, the version control that's an, available on the counter is controlled by the manager or ad administrator. You can attach a barcode reader to the particle counter to capture active air or settle plate um, IDs from barcodes. Uh, straight into the electronic record. So you not only have uh, the um, air particle counts, but you also have the um, settle plate barcodes and the active air plate barcodes tied into that electronic record. So it pulls everything together for you. So as I mentioned, the Clarity software runs inside the counter. There's no external software. And hopefully this allows the user to improve accuracy because your own SOP now resides in the particle counter. There's no paper records. It's an interactive on-screen uh, map. And as the technician moves to each location on the map, they simply tap the location. And this automatically configures the counter exactly as you would according to your SOP. Accuracy is improved because all a technician has to do then is tap run sample. There's no configuration or manual data entry or labels of the sample location, nothing like that. Just simply tap the screen and press run sample. The accuracy is further improved as the SOP version control is now done inside the counter itself. So administrators can log on remotely just using a web browser and configure an SOP and then release it for use using their electronic signature. So the Clarity software creates the final record inside the counter itself. There's no need, you can still have paper printouts, but there's no need for paper printouts or manual data transcription. The record contains the SOP name and version number, uh, the user's electronic signature, the production ID batch if you want that, the location name for the sample, which as I said is pre-programmed, the technician doesn't have to enter that, date and time of course, uh, configuration of the counter, of course, the particle sampling results, including the sample volume that was collected. And if there are any alert or action alarms, they are included in the electronic record. And the user has an opportunity to enter comments, uh, uh, maybe, for instance, to explain what, why the alarms went off um, and, and why it's not an issue. But they all go into the electronic record. And the final step, of course, in the process is the review and approve. Now, the Clarity allows the administrator or the supervisor to log into the particle counter remotely over the Ethernet network, just simply using a web browser. There's no specialist software required. 
and the clarity workflow in, uh, inside the counter allows the, uh, allows the supervisor to review the day sampling and then once they're happy with it they export the whole day sampling as an electronic record um, straight from the counter to their secure server wherever that might be on their network they can do that via USB or wired Ethernet or Wi-Fi and uh, security of this is guaranteed by using their having to use their Microsoft Active Directory credentials to log on to the counter in the first place the counter also contains an integrated audit trail which contains the user ID of the persons running the instrument log on the success and failures of those uh, sample completion changing group permissions uh, calibration information uh, changes to an SOP um, if the uh, data is exported uh, then that's recorded in the audit log as well and any changes to the instrumentation configuration so that concludes my short presentation today um, so if we may let's see if there are any questions in the chat Thank you, Tony, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, thank you for your presentation. There are many particle counters available on the market. Please, can you summarize the key difference with your MET-1 3400 Plus and how it helps improve data integrity? What makes the 3400 Plus different? Thank you for your question. Well, there are four clear differences. Um, the primary one being the map on the screen. Uh, it's an interactive map. and It removes the need to manually configure the counter at each sampling location. And so this avoids errors in the data itself. So the counter also produces the electronic record contemporaneously as the um, sample is taken. And this avoids data errors that can occur when you're manually transcribing from paper into an electronic record. The third point really is that the accuracy of the data is confirmed by the built-in review and approved workflow. So the supervisor can remotely re review the data, make sure it's all been taken that day, just using a web browser and then they can apply their electronic signature to a, a data record and that can be exported. And finally, um, the process of capturing the environmental monitoring samples can be reviewed to make sure there's no errors using the built-in audit trail. Thank you, Tony. Our next question is, you show a remote review and approve feature for the MET-1. What software is required to access the counter remotely and how do you guarantee security? So actually, in fact, you don't need any software to access the counter remotely as long as the counter itself is connected to your company network via the built-in Wi-Fi or wired Ethernet. You can control the SOP versions and review and approve the day's environmental monitoring data from your office remotely just simply using a web browser such as Chrome. And security is assured as the user, when they first log on to the uh, counter, they have to use their Microsoft Active Directory controlled username and password, which is the same they would use to log on to their um, company computer. And they have to enter that into the web browser interface in order to browse the counter remotely. So it's very secure. Great, thank you, Tony. Our last question today, I can see that the Microsoft Active Directory can help records be attributable, but why is it better than usernames and passwords created in the counter itself? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you can choose not to use the Microsoft Active Directory feature if you wish and create local usernames and passwords in the counter itself, but the idea behind using Active Directory is that A, it enforces the users to use the same level of complexity for their username and passwords uh, as is defined by their corporate IT. And B, it stops the use of generic passwords that everybody uses on the counters because they don't want to remember yet another password. So as you can imagine, 
in a fleet of particle counters. It won't take long before the passwords you use on the counter gets out of sync and you end up needing different passwords for different particle counters. So what I've seen is that some teams often use the same generic password. And of course, this remove, uh, downgrades the security and also removes the traceability. So using Active Directory avoids this, as you only have to remember the same password that you use to log on to your company computer each day. Thank you again, Tony Harrison, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.